Welcome to the Invisible Wheelchair Podcast. The Invisible Wheelchair Podcast was selected by Feedspot as one of the top 10 obsessive compulsive disorder podcasts. I'm Donald Grodoff, EFT tapping practitioner and OCD coach at familyocd.com. On the Invisible Wheelchair Podcast, I focus on the hidden world of OCD and anxiety with interviews and information around this topic. My purpose is to bring about awareness of OCD, those who treat OCD, and of course, those who suffer with OCD. Obsessive compulsive disorder is a treatable and manageable disorder. In my practice at familyocd.com, I guide people through the process of ERP therapy and other alternative treatments. If you know of someone suffering with OCD, simply visit familyocd.com. If you or someone you know suffers or has suffered and recovered from OCD and would like to get their story out, simply contact us through www.invisiblewheelchair.com. We want to talk to you and get your story out on the podcast. Know that the ideas and thoughts presented here are not necessarily those of Family OCD, Invisible Wheelchair Podcast, or Donald Grodoff. We also ask you to take just a few moments and leave comments at www.invisiblewheelchair.com. Those comments help us to know what the next topic should be, and we really want to hear from you. Now, let's get to that podcast. This podcast was recorded May 7th, 2020. This is podcast number 42, Understanding Food and Its Effect on Anxiety. This is the first in a series of four podcasts around food and anxiety. Today, I've asked a very special guest so that we can talk about food and how it literally affects the brain and can trigger anxiety. My special guest today is Dr. Lexi Lane, from Summit Vitality in Davidson, North Carolina. Dr. Lexi, welcome to the Invisible Wheelchair Podcast. Thank you. Super excited to share some info that hopefully people can uh, grab some pearls and nuggets. Yes, yes. And, and you know, t- what I'm talking about in this series uh, uh, is about food and, of course, anxiety. And one of the things I, I, I think that I really want to get the public to understand or what my audience to understand is how much food has an effect on how we think and how our brain operates um, and how much it affects anxiety. And by changing diet, you can change everything. You know, you can change a lot in your life. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how you, I know that's a lot of the work you do. Right. So what I was wanted to do in this first part is really talk, really, how does food literally affect the brain? How does the stomach affect the brain? Sure. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, of course, a loaded question, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to have those ones. Yeah, right. So I, I think, first of all, it's really important to understand when we are eating food, food, you know, we think about it not really as building blocks or fuel we just we just eat right we eat because we we want to or we're hungry just by thinking oh i'm hungry well hunger is actually a signal to the brain the whole process of digestion and eating actually is a two-way street between brain and gut Brain is talking to gut and by way of saying, oh my gosh, I'm thinking about food. When you look at a commercial on a TV, I smell the food. If you go to like a state fair, you're just inundated with smells of like fried food. Anyway, and and you, you see food, you think about it. And all those senses are involved in triggering and telling brain, hey, something's about to happen. And then brain will signal down the pathway to the gut through creating saliva. Like for example, if you think about lemons, when you think about a lemon, you automatically salivate. When I was a kid, I used to chew those Sour Patch Kids, you know, those really sour candies. Like just thinking about it, I'm salivating. <laughs> and, and that salivation is brain and memory 
automatically communicating to the first process of our digestion, which is in our mouths. We chew. And then that will cascade down into communications to the stomach and to all these other organs involved in making digestive enzymes. So anyway, so you can see this downstream communication to brain before you actually even put food in your mouth. And then when food does come into your mouth, those are your building blocks. So how are you breaking down and assimilating those building blocks into neurotransmitters, which is basically our brain chemistry? So just in a quick and dirty, you know, that's just your, your introduction into how brain and gut talk to one another um, and how food kind of plays into that on just a basic level. If I'm not mistaken... Protein is a real big builder for the neural pathways. Is that correct? Protein is important, you know, and really healthy fats as well. Uh, you need, you know, every neurotransmitter's got almost like a cholesterol backbone to it. Amino acids, so that protein getting broken down into what we call branched chain amino acids. Those amino acids then get assimilated like L-tryptophan and, you know, glutamate and uh, anyway, so so all L-tyrosine. So these, these amino acids do feed into the those first building blocks into what makes a neurotransmitter or a brain chemistry, like serotonin, dopamine, and GABA. GABA is a big one in our conversation since you're really honing in on anxiety. You know, all of those have an amino acid. And then that, yes, that is coming from a protein and you need to be able to break those down well uh, to, uh, to assimilate. So you just brought up something that, and it's going to go off of uh, the questions we talked about, but I know in my own, uh, in my daughter's experience, GABA played a huge role in the, she had an imbalance of GABA in her system. So how does GABA play a role in anxiety then? Yes, that's a really great question. In our brains, if you were to put your hand in the back of your skull, you're touching what we call the cerebellum. The back of the brain is actually where GABA gets super active. And what happens in, in your question regarding food, because if we're talking a lot about how food uh, relates to anxiety, GABA is one of these, what we call an inhibitory, inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it's going to have a calming effect to it. So what we're doing is we're inhibiting these overexcited pathways. Because when we're anxious, we are being too stimulated. So we need to calm the stimulation down, which GABA plays a big role in. Where food comes in, so I know I think in another podcast that you're going to be doing in this series is about, you know, what foods to avoid. So I'll just give a little, a little um, taster, <laughs> excuse the pun of, uh, of a word there, but gluten proteins, gluten proteins look a lot like an enzyme that plays a role with GABA. And so what happens is that if, if you eat gluten and your immune system and your gut starts to react to gluten, you can have these cross reactions to the GABA pathway. And so what can happen is you get aggravation and anxiety with gluten proteins uh, because gluten, let's just say, looks like A, B, C, D. The GABA pathway might look like A, B, C, D. FG. So that ABC portion is what, they, what the um, immune system grabs onto. And it's like, oh, everything that looks like ABC, I'm going to go and attack. And so it'll attack a gluten ABC and it'll attack a GABA ABC, causing anxiety. So when you pull out the gluten, you're actually calming that immune response, thereby calming GABA response. So that could be just one, one story into how food impacts GABA, but more specifically how food is impacting anxiety, which is why when you pull out gluten, sometimes you'll see your kids or even within yourself, your mood just totally stabilizes and you get kind of even kill. But that doesn't always happen for everybody. It's a, it can be paradoxical, but that's a classic example. What does anxiety then do to the stomach and to the brain? Anxiety... Okay, so let's back up to the beginning. And when I said, you know, you're smelling food, you're thinking about the food. Well, when you're anxious and you're running from the bear, you're not thinking about anything. You're just, you might be 
just shoving food in your mouth and not even thinking or you're you're eating on the go um, or you're just simply anxious and what's happening is you're missing you're missing a lot of various pathways that are crucial in the digestive process what can happen is the anxiety suppresses the stomach acid production the anxiety can suppress the digestive enzymes and then anxiety in some people will create stomach cramping and maybe even diarrhea. Like before presentation, somebody might get the runs where somebody else might get totally constipated. It depends on your picture presentation. But what's happening is there's this nerve called the vagus nerve. And it's like a two-way highway. Just imagine a highway. You've got cars going into the city and you've got cars leaving the city. So it's, it's going both ways. The vagus nerve is just like that. It's talking from brain to gut and then gut to brain. And so when you're anxious, brain's like, I'm running from the bear right now. I don't have time to break down these foods because we got to survive. And so we're going to shut down and, and, and stop all these lovely rest and digest pathways to run. And we'll deal with that later. You do not want to run from the bear and be pooping along the way. Although some people, they, <laughs> some people, you know, <laughs> just seeing the, <laughs> yeah, just seeing the bear may cause that part. You know, <laughs> just seeing the bear just might cause that. That's right. Uh, so you might be <laughs> scared poopless anyway. But uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's a prime example of how fright can <laughs> in fact digestion. Yeah, <laughs> kind of leads me off to a different. That sounds like what what you might talk about in leaky gut. Then would it not? It's, yes, it's kind of the leader the leader to that symptom. Leaky gut is complex because you know the anxiety component. This is this is kind of the the chicken before the egg kind of question because <sighs> which one did come first? The anxiety puts you in this sympathetic state of being, this fight or flight response that's going to have a direct impact on digestion. And if you have poor digestion, then you will cause inflammation along the GI lining, which will then break down the lining. But let's just back up and say, well, did the food come first and the food aggravate the, you know, the anxiety? Well, when you have things like gluten, for example, coming in and that's inflaming the gut lining, that creating leaky gut, then things are passing through the leaky gut and then inflaming brain that way. So again, it's a two way street. So it's really important. And I think this is, if you're listening and you hear anything at all, this is it is that you can't treat brain stuff without treating gut stuff. It's important to treat them both at the same time. Maybe you could delve a little more into that as to what that really means because it has that much power that the stomach that food in the stomach plays that big a role that it, if you want to change the brain you got to change the stomach is that what you're saying in that yes if the brain is on fire the gut is also on fire if the gut is on fire you're more than likely having brain problems too is it true then, because I've heard that uh, if if there's inflammation in the body, there's inflammation that matches that in the brain? Is that true? It depends. So, you know, you have barriers. Barriers are there to protect us. And so the most easy barrier to think about is the skin because it's very visible. The, the gut lining is a barrier, but you also have a blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is what we call a semi-permeable membrane, which is supposed to protect brain from what's happening in the body. And if there's inflammation in the body, blood brain barriers should be protecting us from that. But what can happen over time is that in anxiety, which triggers cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine coupled with an inflamed GI and among other things, your blood brain barrier does start to become AKA leaky where things are passing through the blood brain barrier that really shouldn't be. And those things can be inflammatory, you know, in inflammatory things like, uh, like heavy metals, for example, uh, can cross the blood brain barrier 
and uh, and we want to protect that. Going back to that comment of when brain when gut is on fire, brain is on fire, and vice versa. Oftentimes, you'll see that inflammation in the GI, a leaky gut. Things are passing through that barrier. Inflammatory things are passing through that barrier, but then they'll more than likely also pass through blood brain barrier. So you really do need to strengthen and repair both of those linings. And you can do that through, you know, supplementation, which in children can get tricky. And food can also be tricky too when you're dealing with picky eaters, which is why, you know, in, in that, you know, sensory processing and autistic type spectrum, this can get a little challenging. Food is a really great starting point. And, and that can begin to calm the inflammatory story in gut in body and in brain hope that answers your question yeah i mean because i've kind of led you down a we've kind of gone a a little um different different directions here there's been no real like uh story flow here but uh, i think it's been good to go through some of these different topics yeah saying the same thing but in a few different ways maybe uh, that because that what you're talking about there, am I correct in saying that that's dealing with gut flora or the bi- is it the biome? Is that what you call uh, the, it? The, gut bi- the microbiome? So that's different, you know. Mm-hmm. And so okay. this is this is multifaceted, right? The gut flora are living organisms in us and on us and among us. We have what's called a symbiotic. So if kids are in biology, they might learn about a symbiotic relationship versus a communalistic. Symbiotic basically means that the host and the organism are beneficially getting something out of it. Our food that we eat feeds the gut flora. And the gut flora are these bacterias that are living in, they're very much alive in our GI. And they're busy doing their own thing. So they require food too. And so food, and by way of fiber, comes in and feeds the flora. But the flora, the bacteria, actually will help to break down and metabolize and create neurotransmitters. 90 to 95% of your serotonin is made in your gut. About 50%, maybe more, of dopamine is made in your gut. And then there is a microbiome relationship with GABA, which is important in anxiety, also with gut. Now, GABA isn't directly made in the GI that we know of right now, but we are researching how probiotics or our gut flora can actually help in the GABA production or the GABA relationship with brain. Our bacteria is not only protecting us and strengthening our immune system, but the gut bacteria is there to actually make neurotransmitters in our brain. And and if we don't have that, then we are missing a a big piece of, of of the brain chemistry puzzle. Oh, that that's that's wonderful. <laughs> I don't know. Is there a way of? Well, let me ask you this: Somebody comes in and and you know that they're having gut issues. Now, this is going to be hard to to like give an exact on this. Sure. But what would you know? What would be the process that roughly of what you would go through to change that for them? Sure. It's never one thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when I, when I take a case, Donald, and I'm sure, you know, with working with people, you realize that there are many factors. And so when I have a patient coming in who's got gut stuff, it's rare that you would find them not having brain stuff. But sometimes you do. Sometimes it's just GI, and that's great. But for the sake of this conversation, When there's gut symptoms, there's usually an anxiety, a depression, an insomnia, an OCD, a sensory processing, or whatever it is. And so we have to take a multifaceted approach. And that's what's so beautiful about naturopathic medicine is that we are able to hone in on the mental-emotional component and get the tools that they need. So, for example, the tapping hone in on the food component, which is identifying what foods are inflaming the patient and remove those. And then honing in on, yes, the gut flora and looking at, you know, are there things growing in the GI that shouldn't be there? Pandas, for example. Um, Pandas is a condition where, you know, there's um, 
I think it's strep staph. I cannot believe I'm blanking on it. But anyway, no, there's, strep. you're a strep carrier. And so you can find strep species in the GI, you know, and as it relates to pandas. You know, so you have to, you can't just say, if a patient comes to me and says, <laughs> what's the one thing I can take? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you took a probiotic, a nice, well-rounded probiotic, and then changed your diet to be either anti-inflammatory or, or identifying food sensitivities and removing those, and then worked with someone to do the tapping or to work on the mental emotional component to deal with the anxieties and giving tools coping mechanisms that would be a really good uh foundational plan if, if i had to pick one supplement yes it would be a probiotic but obviously you know we need to strengthen the, and repair the lining you know and that's that includes the blood brain barrier lining well, and, and I think that you just talked about what the difference is between, say, naturopathic and the medical world is the medical world kind of has a structure of, well, when, when they come in, it's something around their stomach, they do this, this, and this. It's kind of set. Everybody's kind of the same set pattern in a way. Right. Whereas you're looking at whole body, whole things that are that are happening and trying to, you know, figure out you got to ha handle all the different complex pieces of it, which is, that's I think, right. is so, so cool. And, that, and that's how you do so well. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, you know, and then the synergy. But, you know, and, and like I hear parents say, well, I know my, my kid will get really aggravated mentally and emotionally, like their anxieties go really high or their, um, their OCD gets really aggravated when they're really constipated, you know, and, you know, what's that constipation doing? Well, pooping is the way that we detox. It's a really great avenue of elimination. And when that stops, where do those toxins go, right? And then that can inflame brain. So if, if parents are listening and they see that connection with their kids, it's because they're packing in the toxins, well, tell them that they just got to go look at a bear, you know, and that'll... <laughs> They've got to go look at a bear. That's it. <laughs> that, that'll solve it right there. So, yes, yes. Um, Send them to and, Yellowstone and put them out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> Is That's there any, any other thoughts that you'd like to get across about this that we haven't covered, I guess? The only thing that I'll say in summary is that food truly is medicine. We truly are what we eat. And if there was anything at all that you did for yourself or your family, it would be to really take a hard look at what you're eating and what things you could change because that will really take you a long way. In fact, in, in, in many, many ways, no matter what supplement regimen you're on, that seems to be the most impactful. And then, you know, obviously combining it with tools like the tapping, for example. But that would be my, my one nugget. And it's a perfect segue into your next podcast talking about specifics around food and what things to avoid. Well, and I'll ask you for your, say, top five, maybe, of foods that you, and I'm not saying that they, they have to take out, but that you would look at that are, tend to be the, the ones that are the, are the worst at or whatever. I don't know how you'd want to say it, but they yeah. kind of your... Well, I can give you my top three hands down, and I'm sure you all, all listeners know what it's going to be. Yeah. It's going to be the gluten and the dairy, and I actually see egg come up a lot so um between gluten dairy and egg those are those are the big ones you know you could explore the, the nut family like peanuts um and what else you know soy as well can be in there but when i run the food sensitivity sensitivity panels those three tend to be kind of my top Mm -hmm. my top food groups you know you can explore nightshades too but we're dealing with kids we're dealing with picky eaters um good luck with that right so yeah. identifying five foods can be really overwhelming identifying just three foods can be overwhelming for some families so if three is overwhelming if you've got a really anxious kid look at gluten first because gluten and the GABA pathways are hugely related and then secondly would be the dairy, and then third would be the egg. Oh, that's great. Uh, and, and you mentioned egg, and that, that, was, that was a trigger that came up from my daughter with her OCD. And I've heard, I've heard that path, uh, that egg, with a lot of different OCD 
patients. So, um, I, so that's wonderful. And, and uh, you know, I guess remind the audience too that it's really best to do this with a professional like Dr. Lexi. Or, or, or some professional, some uh, naturopathic, because they'll help guide you as to what you can do. Um, you can take guesses at it, but it's uh, sometimes very helpful to have somebody to guide you through that. So just a little personal note about yourself. How did you, how did you decide to get into this? <laughs> yeah, so I, in a very, very quick nutshell, I got sick in my undergrad uh, within probably a few weeks of, of starting school. And um, the sickness, it ended up being mono, but I was one of these small percentage that tested negative in those little dried blood spots, which with COVID, you know, testing is is all hot off the press. Anyway, so so I was prescribed an antibiotic, obviously with, with viruses, antibiotics don't work. I was getting worse, essentially, and I was overdosed. Also, you do not give penicillin with mono, and so that put me into Stephen Johnson syndrome, which is not good. So I was going down a very, very scary, very sick road very fast. My lovely mother, she sent me to an angel, I think. Uh, he was some German German man. I don't even remember his name, but he introduced me to naturopathic medicine, and, and the rest is history. <laughs> that that sounds like a great story and I, so uh, next um how how do they best get a hold of you what yes. what, what what's their way of finding you yes so they can go to summit like you're climbing a mountain, vitality, feeling alive. So S U M M I T, V as in Victor, I T A L I T Y dot com. There's blogs, there's a contact form. Uh, setting up a discovery session with me would be a really great starting place just to meet me. And we off obviously offer telehealth. So it doesn't matter if you're not in North Carolina or even Davidson, if you're listening from another state, still feel, feel free to reach out because we can cross the state lines. So, uh, yeah. And so summitvitality.com would be the, the best way. And they can follow me on Facebook and Instagram and uh, LinkedIn and all that good stuff, too. So you can find me on social media. And, of course, I'll remind my audience that I will also have this information up on the InvisibleWheelchair.com site. Well, Dr. Lexi, again, thank you so much for being part of this and answering all my tough questions. Yes. And uh, being able to handle the bear at the same time. It's, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm feeling actually quite calm. So thank you so much, Donald, and, and thank you to the listeners for tuning in. This concludes this podcast. We really would appreciate your comments simply leave a comment at www.invisiblewheelchair.com. There, you're able to submit a comment that will help us determine future podcasts. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the podcast, please email don at invisiblewheelchair.com. Remember, there is a corresponding tapping recording for each of the podcasts, with the exception of the interview podcast. You can find these tapping recordings and archived past podcasts at www.invisiblewheelchair.com. Finally, there is relief for OCD, and we at familyocd.com and focusedhealthyfamily.com can help you find that relief. Again, you can contact us through those sites, familyocd.com or focusedhealthyfamily.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Invisible Wheelchair Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Invisible Wheel One, that's the number one, or at Family OCD. So thank you for listening. Keep tapping and transcending your life to new heights.